and welcome everybody to this charter lecture. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce a very, very dear friend and ex-colleague, um, Dr. Rana Khalifi, who is going to talk to us about uh, biochemical engineering. Uh, and Rana is originally from Lebanon and she has been in the UK for a number of years. She did her PhD at UCL and then she carried on working there as a lecturer um, and mainly leading the regenerative medicine uh, courses over there, but I'm sure that she will tell you more about that. And um, I hope that you enjoy her lecture. And as Jill said, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. And I'll turn my camera and microphone off now. O over to you, Rana. Thank you, Patricia, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Jill, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and give a small talk about uh, something I love, which is stem cells. I kept it a general. I did not include my work uh, on stem cells, but I will go over it uh, in a bit. Um, so um, if you don't mind, when I will start presenting, I will turn off uh, the camera as well and I will talk about it. But first, as Patricia said, I come from Lebanon, a small country which uh, has a really nice food. I don't know if you heard of Lebanon, but I'm pretty sure you've heard of Lebanese food. Um, and I am a biochemist by training, and I did my BS in biochemistry and then my master's in cancer research. But then I wanted to uh, make a difference. Um, it's nice when you do master research, cancer research, you publish a paper, but then you think about it, okay, how can I translate this into real life? And this is when I started my search to do my PhD. And I saw the biochemical engineering department, um, specifically in cell and gene therapy. So I was interested in this. Uh, so I started my PhD in 2014. And I was interested in stem cells, more or less on uh, pluripotent stem cells. And I tried to combine my background as a biochemist and metabolism with uh, engineering aspect and i will tell you that my perspective of engineering has changed or even like a biology because i remember my um my supervisor told me rana you, we are in a biochemical engineering department maybe the biologist will be like this is the input of the process uh this is let's investigate about the molecular mechanism but for engineering, and this will be part of my uh, presentation at the beginning, we care about the output or how can we translate this into real life, make it affordable for everyone as well. OK, I'm responsible also for the outreach. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, school visit as well. Uh, and uh, recently I started uh, the, prog the role of program director uh, for the commercialization and manufacturing for stem cell and gene therapy which is like the longest uh, title. Okay, so um, because I'm an outreach person, I will, uh, I need to advertise my department. So I will just briefly go over the department and then I will start with the, um, with the lecture. Okay, so I'll stop the video now. And I will present. Okay, can you all see my screen? Rana, it's gone back to, to normal view instead of a full screen. So if you right. click on the full screen. Sure. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's start with uh, UCL Biochemical Engineer, or let's start first with uh, UCL. We've been known for disruptive uh, thinking uh, since uh, 1826. Do you know who is showing in this picture? You can type it in the chat if you want. Okay, so this is uh, Jeremy Bentherman, and he's not the founder of UCL. He's more of the spiritual uh, founder of UCL because he thought that uh, education should be available to all who could benefit from. 
and we were known from uh, for this and we were the first in england to welcome women in university and to teach uh, languages uh, such as german chemistry engineer um, plus uh, to be able to uh, for example combining art with science so we have special department which is art and uh, science as well so let's talk about biochemical engineering because i got a lot of questions during the outreach what is biochemical engineer uh, does it involve a lot of chemistry or what's the difference between my favorite question what's the difference between biochemical and chemical engineer or biomedical engineer as well so um, biochemical engineering is basically an interdisciplinary field between chemical engineer and biotechnology um, even uh, it has some of the biology some of the engineering aspect uh, um, and so on the main focus in our department is to translate this into real life and to lower the cost of the therapy and maybe you will hear me saying a lot of the reducing the cost how can you how can we do this let me tell you something so a lot of things we have found like a cure for let's say cancer or treatment of diabetes let's say so you discover it in the lab scale but then how can we translate this as a manufacturing aspect so i'm not generating let's say a small dose for one patient no i'm treating many patients at the same time so how can we do this how can we translate into a bigger scale and then give it to people but this does not include a lot of this is not easy at all because it will involve what we say scaling up that means the production of the materials that we need in a larger scale and this is what we call for example a bioreactor or like a big tank now other than this we deal with the regulation that we need to follow in which country we are based on plus when we have something we need to do preclinical trials clinical trials and then release it into the market so we try to teach our students all of these kind of aspects and the challenges and how we can overcome these challenges um and maybe the first one who really discovered do you know who discovered the penicillin you can type it in the chat if you want Well, Fleming discovered it, yes. but it, but it wasn't uh, developed until Florian Chain came along. Yes, exactly. So Fleming, uh, Sir Alex Fleming uh, discovered this, uh, as you all mentioned, as uh, you mentioned. But to be honest, like the engineering aspect of it is to produce a larger scale of it uh, was done by Margaret uh, Hutchison. Uh, she was an American engineer, and she was the first to design a commercial penicillin product based uh, production plant. Um, and she was the first female member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. So she wanted to produce on a larger scale. So this is what I told you about. Usually the discovery as a lab based, uh, it can take two to five years. And then you have the preclinical trials and clinical trials, and then you have to release the product. Not only you have to release the product, you have to make sure that this product is safe for patient. So we do a lot of something we call QA, quality attribute, or QC, quality control, in order to make sure that the product is safe um, and then um, it is the cells, for example, that we need to give to the patient, it's right, the right product. Not only that, we have to think about where are we based? If I am based in London, but my patient is, let's say, in uh, Dublin. How can I ship it? At which temperature? Will my product be stable? So all of these things are kind of like challenges when it comes to manufacturing and producing at larger scale. So uh, early next year, we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of biochemical engineering uh, split from chemical engineer um, and we were the first to teach biochemical engineer as undergraduate uh, subject uh, sorry undergraduate uh, subject um, 
And although we are a small department, but we have a lot of academics, uh, more than 20 members of academic uh, lecturer in terms of teaching and research fellow and so on. And each one of us do different things. So you will see that some of us uh, do vaccine bioprocessing. Um, and during the pandemic, the government has granted us some money because we have something called the Vax Hub, in which is a collaboration between different universities and uh, different industries. So we were uh, in contact with AstraZeneca and Oxford Biomedica, and we were our research uh, students, especially like PhD and postdocs, they were in the lab because they were uh, trying to optimize the filling process of the vaccine. Uh, some of us uh, work with algae for bioethanol or to, to reduce the pollution. Um, we have also people working on the vax, uh, on sorry, on the plastic degradation and synthetic biology. And I'm a bit biased for regenerative medicine, uh, so. Even in regenerative medicine, we have a lot of research going on. So we have people uh, working on pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we have people working on mesenchymal stem cells, MSC, which is adult stem cell. And now with the current hot topic happening in cell and gene therapy, which is the CAR T therapy, which I will touch base at the end. Now, when I first came to the department, um, I did not understand some terms. Like, for example, upstream, downstream, scale up, scale down, scale out. So it's a learning curve. So whatever you choose to do as um, undergraduate study, it's a learning curve. We always learn something new each day. So when it comes to bioprocessing, um, we teach the students some of the upstreams and downstreams. So I will, I will tell you. So let's say that I am producing insulin from a bacteria. OK, so I will genetically modify the bacteria and instead of growing the bacteria in a Petri dish, I will start growing them in suspension. That means they're not attached yeah? in a smaller scale, which is like few ml. This is a shaker flask and it can range up to 250 ml. And then once I establish a solid protocol, I can do something we call scale up. That means I am increasing the volume of it. So I can, I can go for a 20 or for 10 liters, then 100 liters and so on. So this is what we call the upstream. So how big you can grow your cells and expand them. Now, if the bacteria grow the insulin, now they need to secrete it and I need to collect it. So this is what we call a downstream. So for example, we collect the cells, we lyse the cells, and then we do a serial of uh, kind of purification to get just the insulin. And then we need to test that we have the right molecule of insulin, let's say, and then we store it minus 20 or 4 degree, and then we give it to the patient. So this is what we call upstream and downstream. Bit of advertising here. So if you're interested in becoming a biochemical engineering, you can visit our website. Um, but whatever you choose, I would recommend you to do something that you don't just go to the lectures and do lectures and practicals. Um, how we teach our students, of course, they're going to have lectures. Of course, they're going to have practicals. But we try to build some of the challenges. So for example, in their first year, they go to an ice cream manufacturing and they try to, um, to optimize the process. Second year, they spend one week with PhD student working on a project. So. And what you can see here in the, in the picture, uh, they went to the, uh, well, this was before the pandemic, they went to the uh, parliament and presented their poster and they were, work, were working on um, uh, coffee beans um, as well. Um, not only this, we give the opportunity for our students to spend time uh, in the lab with us. Um, we have something called IGEM, uh, International Genetically Engineered Machinery in which the students work with us during summer. And then we used to fly to Boston, but this year is going to be in Paris. Um, the team are working now, finalizing everything. So fingers crossed, um, and it's going to happen in two weeks time. So fingers crossed that they will win uh, gold medal, medals. So in 2019, for example, they were 
uh, creating kind of like a capsule from bacteria and put inside a drug that will target uh, cancer cells. And we went through the proof of concept and um, they won a gold medal and several um, prizes. Not only that, we like uh, our students to be exposed to the industrial uh, contact that we have. So for example, during their poster session and the research project or design project, we invite people from company. And as you can see, we collaborate with a lot of uh, big uh, companies and they're always interested to come back and interact with our students. And, and it's nice because whenever we go on a conference, we always see the same people, our graduate, undergrad or postgraduate students, uh, because they work in uh, this kind of cell and gene therapy. We have a lot of spin out company from our department. Uh, for example, this is Ewan, and he started a company called Puridify. Um, for example, my uh, super my PhD supervisor also had a split up uh, company split out company from UCL, Ori Biotech, and they're hiring our uh, our students as well. Now I'm not gonna go into details of this because I need to start talking about the favorite topic of all, uh, which is stem cells. Uh, but if you're interested in our undergraduate study, we have different routes. We have the BNG and, and two BSc Science and Engineering and Business and Management. Each one of them is, is different. So engineering will focus more on the engineering um, aspect. Um, and the bioprocessing, it depends more science or more into business and management. The fourth year for the uh, Amanj student can go to, uh, to, to do it well. They can do it in the department. They can do it in collaboration with chemical engineer or business and management. But the most uh, common uh, favor for the students are the study abroad or year in industry. So the students will be working uh, in industry while doing their MSc, but they come uh, well doing their masters, but they come for us just for uh, small courses. So if you're interested in this, you can visit um, the website to see even the entry requirements. Um, so the most two common questions I got uh, during the open days is what's the difference? And the second one is what can I work after I graduate? Well, uh, we have a variety of uh, degrees, uh, a variety of uh, jobs uh, that our students chose uh, after they finished, some of them in consultancy, even in let's say a cell and gene therapy uh, industry company, some of them they do business and management some of them they do uh, project management some of them they do uh, pro, um, scientists so there are a lot of variety and a lot of companies and it's a growing uh, section and i will tell you why so uh, before the pandemic i went to catapult and um, it was there was like a meeting between academia and industry and they were saying that we are lacking, uh, we need people with bioprocessing aspect because the field is growing so much um, and we need more people. And it was estimated that by 2024, they needed 6,000 jobs per year to fill this kind of gap. Okay, uh, why studying at UCL? Uh, because we're top two university for research power and we were the best for uh, we had a really good um, score for the knowledge exchange framework, but I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to focus now more on cell and gene therapy. So why am I giving you a talk today about cell and gene therapy? And how is my talk integrated in our degrees? We teach our students cell and gene therapy in different aspects. So they can do their PhD, their doctorate, or they can take some courses. Uh, plus, as I told you, we started a new MSc, which is Commercialization and Manufacturing of Stem Cell and Gene Therapy, which I'm the program director of it. Now, for the undergraduate within the Faculty of Engineering, uh, students can take a minor. So you can be a chemical engineer with a biochemical engineering minor, or you can do computer science with chemical engineer in, in minor. So we teach cell and gene therapy uh, for those who are taking the minor. 
Now, why and why we started even uh, expanding with the, with the masters? Because the, uh, for example, uh, Scott, who is the commissioner of food and drugs, have highlighted that although uh, we have seen an improve in global health and wealth, manufacturing based therapy economics we need to look into it more into depth and then we have to um, uh, like we have to look into the challenges when it comes to manufacturing because how can we how can we uh, produce more of this kind of cell therapy while maintaining the quality attribute and how can we make it um, affordable to everyone. So, how do we teach uh, the, the cell and gene therapy or how can we overcome these kind of challenges? When it comes to cell and gene therapy or regenerative medicine, it's really a broad topic because it can involve cell therapy by itself. It can involve tissue engineering. So when you put your, uh, the cells with an extracellular matrix, um, and even it can uh, uh, include um, the uh, CAR T therapy as well. So if you look into this maybe 20 years ago or even more, you will be like thinking, okay, this is science fiction. It's not going to happen. We're not going to do any clinical trial in which you are transplanting cells, for example, into a new, uh, new human being. Or for example, you would say, no, we cannot treat uh, leukemia. But nowadays, as um, this field has progressed and we're seeing a lot of clinical trials happening, our hope like to, to at least to, uh, to reach a product for cell and gene therapy in the market has increased. Now, there are a lot of products. Uh, so for example, uh, Provence is a gene therapy, but it costs $96,000. Uh, so there are a few um, in the market, but still the prices is uh, high. Now, let's talk about stem cells, um, the clinical trials, and what has been uh, done recently. Anyone familiar with the term stem cells or pluripotent stem cells, and you would like to post it? Any thought about pluripotent stem cell as well? Yes, thank you, Jill. I know, I know, IPS are very cool. Okay, so let's start. So stem cells are uh, known of uh, their ability to duplicate or for self-renewal, that means they can proliferate Unspecialized cells in bone marrow. Some of the type of stem cells are present in bone marrow, yes. So they're, they're known that they can proliferate and they can self-renew uh, uncontrollably while, while staying in undifferentiated state. Okay? Now, these type of stem cells can differentiate into a specific type of cells, which we call potency. Now, we have different types of pluripotent stem cells. We have the totipotent one, which is present in the, uh, when the uh, embryo is only four cells. We have the pluripotent stem cells. And then I'm going to focus most of my talk on pluripotent stem cells. And then we have the multipotent. The multipotent, or you can call it, um, uh, like they will be with the specialized uh, tissue as well, and then they will differentiate into only limited type of cells. Now, the adult stem cells, for example, hematopoietic stem cells, are cells that will give you only the blood type. Mesenchymal stem cells are adult stem cells that will give you also specific type of cells, okay? Um, now, let's talk about pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells, one type of the pluripotent stem cells are embryonic stem cells that can be isolated from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst 
and they can give rise to all cell type in your body okay so this is what i uh, mentioned you so upon fertilization you start to form uh, the, uh, the zygote and then they will divide now the embryonic stem cells can be isolated from the inner cell mass now once you have these kind of embryonic stem cells the first thing that they will differentiate into are germ layers now what does it mean germ layer this germ layer kind of like the inner zone middle zone and outer zone and each one of these germ layer will give rise to different things okay so for example the endoderm is the most inner um, germ layer uh, in, uh, after differentiation they can give liver cells pancreatic cells Mesoderm can give you, for example, uh, more uh, of uh, cordial mesendoderm or uh, some uh, parietal uh, plural, for example. Ectoderm, which is like the most famous one, is like the neurons. So they will give you uh, these kind of uh, things. So you can see that after differentiation, after these pluripotent stem cells start to differentiate, they will start to form different cell type and they will come together as a tissue and then organ. Now, when people tell me who is the father of uh, stem, pluripotent stem cells, there is not a specific one because each of these uh, professor and uh, Nobel Prize winners are, uh, are different. So the first one who was able to isolate human embryonic stem cells was, was James Thompson. And when this happened, everyone was rushing into uh, stem cell therapy and they wanted to learn more about how to grow these cells, how to differentiate them, how to build like an organ. But then this kind of research has stopped. Do you know why it has stopped? And actually it was banned in some of the countries. Any idea? around 2000 it was stopped can you think about any challenge or yes ethics right joe so it was stopped uh, because uh, of the ethics until quietly everyone was working on it until uh, shinya yamanaka in 2007 discovered that you can program any cell any nucleated cell type in your body to become stem cell pluripotent stem cell and i remember the story i've been told uh, that there was a big stem cell conference in canada and yamanaka was doing the last presentation and he was a postdoc and he was presenting his data um, and someone else in the u.s was working on the same kind of aspect but he presented his data first and no one believed him until he published his paper. And it was kind of like kind of a revolution that they give him the Nobel Prize in 2012. Okay. So the idea of stem cells did not come out all of the sudden uh, by just like uh, people got in, inspired, inspired uh, at specific uh, point. There was a lot of things happening during the history that has led to the idea of developing pluripotent stem cells or what do we call induced pluripotent stem cell. And this is what Yamanaka did. So uh, a lot of things uh, um, helped in developing this kind of idea from cloning uh, frogs in uh, 1962 to cloning Dolly to like the discovery of how can um, the transcriptional factor or a master regulator uh, regulate the cell uh, phase as well okay so as i mentioned before you can isolate embryonic stem cell from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst um, or what yamanaka did is that you can take any nucleated cells in your body and he did it first on the skin fibroblast and then you can uh, induce the cells to become pluripotent stem cells and he called it induced pluripotent stem cells once we have this we can differentiate these cells into any cell type in your body 
and then we can transplant it to the patient. Now, by discovering this, Yamanaka overcome a lot of challenges. Can some, someone name me other than ethics? Which kind of challenge do you think between embryonic stem cell therapy and IPS stem cell therapy? Or, or how could IPS stem cell therapy overcome some of the challenges in embryonic stem cells? Any idea? Wrong. Could be. But the, the main thing is that even when you have embryonic stem cells and then you differentiated, let's say, to uh, retinal cells for patients who have lost their vision. Uh, so people suffering from uh, AMD, for example. Yes, it is personalized medicine. Um, so when I give a patient uh, cells that are from embryo, so they are foreign to his, uh, to his or her body. That means the immune system is going to recognize it and get rid of it. So by doing IPS, we're favoring more, well, when they first start thinking about it, you're favoring more autologous therapy. What does it mean? That means it's from patient to patient. That means I can take, let's say, skin from the patient, reprogram it to become induced pluripotent stem cells, and then I will differentiate it into, let's say I'm interested in retinal cells, and then I will give it to the patient. That means the patient's body is not going to recognize it as a foreign uh, body and it's not going to get rid of it. Now, can, so by doing IPS therapies, you are overcoming the uh, embryonic stem cell challenges such as ethics, such as uh, immunorejection. But one of the main challenges in IPS therapy is the cost of it and like how long it can take. So, for example, in our labs, when we take, let's say, skin fibroblasts and we want to reprogram it, that can take up to like one month to have like really defined uh, stems, uh, pluripotent stem cells. Then we have to characterize it to make sure that we have the correct cell type. And then the differentiation protocol take around like one month, uh, for example, for retina and then give it back to the patient. So it takes a longer, uh, longer time, plus the cost of the therapy is very high. Now, since 2007 till now, it's more than 10 years celebrating IPS, and there has been a lot of application uh, for IPS. So, for example, uh, you can use it for uh, treatment, and I'm going to go over the clinical trials in a bit, but what you can do as well is kind of, uh, you can use it as disease modeling. Uh, so, for example, you take, if someone is suffering, let's say, from Parkinson's disease, Usually, we give them a drug called levodopa. If you want to test uh, new drugs, for example, so you can take the cells from the patient, reprogram it to become IPS, and then differentiate it, and then you can test different drugs to see the effect of it. Now, uh, there are a lot of clinical trials uh, happening, but I, as I told you, usually when you have a product, you have to test it in preclinical and then go to phase one, two, and three before releasing the product. Most of the clinical trials happening nowadays, they're still for macular degeneration, uh, maybe because it's the most developed, and I will be talking about the first clinical trials happening. Um, now with uh, Kyoto University as well, they're doing uh, Parkinson uh, disease as well. But you can see that there is a lot of other clinical trials happening for pancreatic, for example, um, or spinal cord injury. Now, the first, so as I mentioned, the, the Nobel Prize winner Yamanaka have a center in Kyoto called Saira Center, in which the university or the Japanese also government, and he gets other funds. They give them a lot of funds to do uh, some clinical trials and like to optimize the research and so on. So they were the first to do the clinical trials from IPS. So the patient suffered from loss of vision. So they took her skin um, cells, they reprogrammed it to become IPS, and then they differentiated into retina. And I remember in 2014, I was in a conference there 
and he was like, and I want to tell you the story for you to see how accurate we have to be and how safety is important. And he said, the cells are ready for to give it to the patient. But we did all the screening and we saw a mutation in a non-coding sequence uh, in the cells. Shall we give it to the patient or not? So I want to see now, what do you think? A mutation in a non-coding sequence, shall they give the cells to the patient or not? No. Yeah, you're right. So they they did not uh, give it to the patient. They discarded and then they started again. But in 2014, later on this year, they were lucky in that year. They were lucky and then they were able to uh, give it to the patient. Now, um, later on they focused on something sorry they focused on something else uh, which is uh, parkinson uh, disease as well and they were able to uh, reprogram uh, stem cells and then differentiate it into parkinson um, but i think uh, yamanaka did not stop there and as i mentioned ips when it was first made it was kind of autologous, patient to patient. So what do you think was his second step after generating IPS? Any idea? So first conference I went in 2014. So he, he mentioned what his next step was in 2019. Idea? What would you expect after generating IPS? No idea? Okay. So he was like, check safety in other animals. So usually the the safety thing we do it in the in the when you characterize the stem cell. Yes, making them more shared. So he was like, we're gonna do a universal IPS. And it's a bit crazy because he was like, by 2020, we will be able to have one IPS that is compatible for 90% of the Japan, Japanese population. They could create a type of IPS from the host. Yes. Well, so what they're doing, um, so they're trying to generate a, what we call universal um, IPS. Now, you already know that on the cells, we have something called HLA typing. Are you familiar with HLA? which is kind of like self-recognition, which is your immune response, immune system, sorry, you're gonna recognize this kind of receptor on your cells and would know if these kind of cells are your cells or foreigner. And if it's foreigner, they will kill it. Now, we cannot remove all of these HLA because they were like, okay, maybe we can reprogram IPS and we remove all of the HLA on the surface. But you cannot do this because when you remove all of this kind of receptor, the immune system is going to recognize it as a foreign and get rid of it. So they're, they're trying to modify it. So I'm not going to go into details. And so far, they've been successful in generating uh, this kind of universal. But the word universal is not like the idea of having one cell line that is compatible with all of the population. It's basically having different universal which each and each of these universal stem cells can uh, be given to uh, many uh, many or like a big uh, common um, sorry population now i want to talk about a small topic but then we can try to link it and maybe have a discussion 
how can we link stem cell with the newest one? Um, now, what I mentioned is that because they're doing it in Japan, you will have uh, less what we call polymorphism. That means variation in the DNA. So you can easily find uh, people with similar uh, haplotype or with similar um, HLA typing. Um, it doesn't depend on the ethnicity, but when you have a variation in the DNA as polymorphism in population, you won't have this kind of HLA uh, matching as well. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just stop uh, sharing my screen because I just want to show you something and then we can continue. Just give me one moment, please. See, after two years of pandemic and we still have problems. Okay, so um, I wanted to show you uh, a new therapy for cancer and then we can link it, uh, how we can use stem cell in this kind of therapy. And now what they're trying to do with uh, stem cell therapy. So you already know that people with leukemia, which is a blood type of cancer, go through a lot of chemotherapy. And you know, like in the chemotherapy, you're killing your, the normal cells and then the cancer cells. And uh, the effect of it can be really uh, and bad on, on the kids. Now, um, we can share the video maybe later on uh, so you can watch it because it's very emotional video and it's kind of remind us what do we do, uh, why we're doing cell and gene therapy and try to just uh, push us to do uh, something more. So this is Emily Withard and Emily, um, she did not respond to any of the chemotherapy and this was happening as uh, a trial and then uh, she was happy to, to receive this kind of a treatment. Now, this is Layla. Layla, she was the first UK child to take this at uh, ICH, Institute of uh, Child Health. And I'm going to tell you which, what is this type of uh, treatment. But before, now Emily is celebrating her 10th, 10 years uh, anniversary of Cancer Free. She started, uh, she started her, her own uh, foundation, so Emily Withered Foundation, and they're just going around the world. They were here in the UK a few months ago uh, to, uh, to have kind of like a campaign to raise money for people with cancer. And Emily is such a character that uh, when she went to see the uh, US president, do you know what did she ask him for? So if you see like a president, after your treatment, what would you ask him for? Money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Money to do research, huh? Okay. <laughs> Money for more research. Exactly. Exactly. Well, she did not. She was like, uh, please, the school, they don't know that I'm here to see you. So can you please uh, write a letter so you, they can excuse me from not attending the school? And she's, well, she's like a quiet character. That's why like she started the, the foundation with her parents and they're just going around uh, to raise more awareness uh, of this type of treatment as well. So basically, if a patient is suffering from leukemia, we take, the, we take blood from the patient uh, and then we isolate something called T cells. Do you know why we take T-cells? What is the role of T-cells in our body? Any thoughts? Yes, they kill bad things. So, exactly. So, the T-cells are uh, the killer in your cells. They try to def defend us. And they are the one that will kill the cancer. So, we take T-cells and then we modify them so they can express something on their surface to kill the cancer. So we modify them, we grow them in the lab, and then we give them back to the uh, patient. Now, I summarize this, like there are a lot of details, but this is like in summary. And they give it back to the patient. When you will see the video, you will see that when Emma, they gave her this, because of 
the T cells fighting and releasing some stuff, her temperature increased so bad that they had to put her into coma for her body to, uh, to decrease its temperature. Now, that's a good thing, right? We found a cure for leukemia. Any challenge in this? Can you spot a challenge? Nowadays, they started uh, the, uh, the clinical trials for solid tumors for ovarian and, if I'm not mistaken, lung maybe. But that will be a challenge because if it's leukemia, it's in the blood. And then when they give it to the CAR-T to the blood, it's directly to the blood. But for a solid tumor, it's like a 3D aggregate. So how can you make sure that you will kill all of the cancer cells? How long the T cells last for? The more they last, the more they're gonna release something we call cytokines, which will trigger some response in our body. So what they're doing now, uh, really good, uh, good point, is they're trying to put kind of switch on, switch off gene inside it, so we can limit the uh, the symptoms seen on the patient. How to make this treatment affordable for lots of patients? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, very specific. This is patient to patient. So all of these are autologous therapy. Okay. Uh, based on this point, affordable, roughly estimation, how much does this cost? Roughly. Exactly. 10 to 6 pound, we wish, we wish. <laughs> so the first two products, now we have five products in market. The first two products that, was, uh, that were released in 2017 were uh, the Kimbria from Norvartis and Yiscarta, and it's around $475,000 uh, per product. Now, um, three years ago, the NHS was not agreeing uh, on this price, but they come up with a solution with uh, Kimria, uh, with Norvartis, sorry, to decrease it to up to uh, £2,000. I don't know if, if this is still the same or not. And the first NHS patient have received it a few years uh, ago as well. So this is based on the question uh, on the uh, thing mentioned earlier in the chat. We have ongoing CAR-T uh, therapies on uh, solid organs like brain, uh, GI uh, cancer, renal, prostate, ovarian. Now they're still in phase one uh, and some of them they're still recruiting people, but we're gonna see um, its effect and let's hope for the, the best. Now, um, I've mentioned CAR-T for a specific reason to tell you what's, so they generated IPS, they're trying to generate a universal IPS. Now, let's, let's talk about how IPS can be linked to CAR-T. Any idea what they're doing nowadays? Maybe we can have it as a discussion. Yes, CAR-T from IPS are using T cells instead of skin. So what they're trying to do now is generate something called ICAR. So it's instead of IPS, it's called ICAR. Uh, each type of cancer has universal type. Yeah, so they're trying now to generate uh, CAR-T therapy from a universal IPS. And by doing this, you are, first you're gonna have off-shelf product. That means the product is ready for the patient. So he, he, they don't have to wait for anything. Other than this, when you have a universal product, so you are, instead of giving it patient to patient, which is autologous therapy, we are talking about allogeneic therapy. That means from one patient you can give to many patients. That means instead of growing the cells in a small scale, you grow it in a larger scale and then you can decrease the cost of it. 
So by generating ICAR, you will be able to reduce, hopefully, the cost uh, of the 475,000, okay? So uh, hope that was uh, insightful, and I'm happy to take any question. That was great. Thank you so much, Fana.